Bible Sunday School book. I have a commentary and also have a student book. The very last story in today's student book. Did anybody in our Sunday School class read it? It says, who does God say you are? And there's a list of things from out of the Word of God that should make us all very thankful. For instance, it says that we are a new creation in Christ. Aren't you thankful that you're not the person you used to be? Amen. Amen. It says, second thing, who does God say you are? It says you're a child of God. Amen. Amen. I oftentimes hear from people that <laughs> when both of their parents are gone, they say, well, I guess now I'm an orphan. You're never an orphan in God's family. Amen. We are a child of God. We are a branch of the true vine. We are a friend of Jesus. We are justified, redeemed. There's a whole lot of things. I'm going to comment on a couple of these today. I also have on my Bible, today when I was putting on my coat, ended up finding some cards from the International Mission Board. I stuck it in there, probably... Well, sometime this past year when I wore this coat, whenever the last time was. <laughs> On this uh, front one, like I said, I haven't even opened it yet. It talks about the country of Susu. <coughs> it's over in West Africa. <coughs> maybe it's not a country, maybe it's a... <coughs> Maybe it's a group of people, but it says that there are one million of these people with fewer than 150 of them being Christians. On the back, it talks about the Zerma. So the Zerma have a population of nearly 2.9 million and are primarily farmers. Their staple crop is millet, but they also grow a variety of vegetables and fruits. They raise chickens and some cattle, generally slaughter the cattle only for religious ceremonies and festivals. 80% <coughs> of this 2.9 million profess to be Muslim, although their Islamic beliefs have been somewhat intermingled with animism, the belief that natural objects are inhabited by spirits. There are fewer than 150 Zerma Christians. And I ended up thinking with regard to this and also this. When I come to Thanksgiving, I woke up this morning and been thinking about a Thanksgiving message all week long. And I said, Lord, I don't know exactly what I need to thank you for or what I need to preach. But I said, there's some things that I want to be thankful for. And when I read these cards, I ended up thanking God for my Christian background. Amen. Amen. Because I have belief in someone named Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I believe that this Jesus that died on the cross, he rose three days later. And this Jesus has ended up saying to anybody that will believe in him, I will raise you up too at the last day. And I want you to know when I raise you up, I have gone and prepared a place for you. That when I come, I'm going to take you to be with me. And I thank God that I know these things. And then I read stories like this about people around the world that never have an opportunity to know. And I say, Lord, I want to thank you again for what my Christian faith means to me. And that's what I want to preach to you this morning about. I want to share with you five things. And these aren't necessarily the most important the five things that I'm very thankful for about my Christian experience. Where do I start? I know in my book here I wrote down a couple of them. How about we start with probably the most familiar passage of Scripture in the Word of God? What would you say that is? What does John 3.16 say? Uh -huh. Uh, for God so loved the world, and He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
How do you and I get eternal life? Faith in Jesus. Yes. You can't earn it. Can you do enough good things to get yourself into heaven? No. That is not the way heaven works at all. Jesus ended up knowing that none of us would ever make it to heaven on our own. None of us. And I'll kind of use this as an illustration. I've, I've used it years ago. I don't know Bill Gates, but I understand that he's got a very, very big, expensive house. In fact, I think I read one time that even in the pool, when you swam underwater, it played music. They've got the ears. They've got everything that you could possibly need. Now let me ask you a question. Let's suppose after church today I decided to give somebody a ride home that needs a ride home. That's a nice thing to do, isn't it? Amen. Maybe it could be somebody from the church. Maybe it could be to stop and pick up a hitchhiker. So you'd end up saying that's a good deed. Now let me ask you a question. Let's suppose after I did that good deed, I make the trip over to, I think it's Seattle, Washington, over there. Maybe I'm totally ignorant, but I was thinking that that's where Bill Gates lived. I made a trip over there to his house, and I'm assuming that there's gates there to his house. I'm assuming that it's one of those places that you just can't walk in and right house. Well, let's suppose I drove all the way across the country, and I stand outside his house and end up saying, Hey, Bill, <laughs> let me come into your house. Bill Gates is going to say what to me? Who are you? Who are you? I say, well, I'm Tim Caldwell. Then he's going to say, yeah. why, should, why should I let you come into my house? And I end up saying to him, well, because after church today, I saw somebody needed a ride and I gave them a ride. Bill Gates is going to say, so what? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so what? <clears throat> What's my point? The only way I get into Bill Gates' house is what? Yeah, Not no, by no. doing good works, by what? Getting to know him. You got to know him. You got to have an invitation. that a lot of people end up thinking with regard to heaven. I just do good deeds. And God's going to let me in. No. You've got to have an invitation. You've got to know Him. How do you get to know God? Through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, when you have seen me, you've seen the Father. You reject me, you reject God. You accept me, you accept God. When you come to know Jesus, Jesus ends up saying, you want to get in my father's house? <laughs> I can arrange it. <laughs> the father shows up at the gates. He ends up saying, why should I let you in? We don't stand there and say, because I did such and such. We end up saying, because we know Jesus. Jesus. I'm so glad that somebody taught us John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, folks, we are saved not by works. <clears throat> Chuck would end up underlining this in all of the Gideon Bibles when he'd stop at the motels on the way to Florida. And when he came back, he would end up going to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I maybe need to get off of this before I fall off my soapbox. But if a person wanted to make the argument for getting into heaven by good deeds, what's the criteria? How many good deeds? How good of a deed? What about the people that end up born into this life that they really can't do much of anything? They wouldn't stand a chance. God has made salvation available to everybody through faith. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I'm so thankful that salvation is easy. It's even easy enough for me. And I'm telling you right now, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I don't plan to go to heaven because I'm a preacher. I don't plan to go to heaven because I do good deeds. I don't plan on going to heaven because I read my Bible or because I give offerings at church. I don't plan to go to heaven because I say my prayers. I don't plan to go to heaven except for one thing. I know Jesus. Jesus is making it all possible. John 3.16 tells me that. I know there's no way that I'm going to get through all of my things that I'm thankful for. There's another passage of scripture that immediately came to mind of what I'm thankful for this, this Thanksgiving. 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. I mentioned it during Sunday school. You know what it says? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why am I thankful for that? I will tell you something about myself, but at the same time, I'm going to tell you something about yourself. I am not a perfect person, and neither are you. And I'm going to let you know as a pastor right now, I don't care how hard you try, sooner or later, you're going to sin. I'm not encouraging you to do it. In fact, I'm discouraging you from doing it. I want to tell you loud and clear right now, don't do it. Don't do it. But I don't care how much I holler at you, don't do it. You're going to do it. Guess what? I'm going to do it. I can liken this to trying to swim the Pacific Ocean underwater. Now, I might go over there to the coast of California and take a real deep breath. Now, I could take Clyde over there. Clyde doesn't swim at all. Clyde maybe could take a deep breath and he might push himself three or four feet underneath the water and then pull his head up out of the water and gasp to see whether he's still alive. I might be able to go out 50 feet underwater, but when I come up out of that water, I still got a long way to go to get to the other side. <coughs> I'll tell you what, oftentimes as a pastor, that's the way I feel about sin in my life. It doesn't matter how hard I try to do everything exactly right, I mess up. And I want to tell you something. Your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, knew that you would mess up and he knew that I would mess up. And that's why Jesus says, listen, that's why I came. 
You need somebody not only to save you from your sins, you need somebody to forgive you of your sins because if God was keeping a record of everything that you've done wrong and he decides to finally pay, have you pay up, you're in a heap of trouble. Jesus ends up saying, listen, I want to let you know something. I am willing every time that you sin to take my blood and cleanse you, forgive you of the sin that you've committed. The book of Hebrews, it ends up saying, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness or remission of sin. In the Old Testament, it was one of those things that God declared, hey, when a sin is committed, blood is required. When Adam and Eve sinned, God says, in the day that you sin, you shall surely die. The life is in the blood. And Jesus says, if a life is required for your sin, I've got good news for you. I gave my life for your sin. What sin, Jesus? Just the big ones? No. Jesus says, I want you to know, I died for every sin. Your past sins, your present sins, your future sins. They are all under the blood. Jesus not only forgives us for our sins, but do you know the other thing that he says in that passage of Scripture? And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus gets into our life and he begins to remove the stain from that sin. What is a stain? It's something that you can't get out on your own. Jesus is at work in your life removing that that made you unclean in the Father's sight. It's tough to get out stains? Yeah. Is it tough to get rid of our sins? Yeah. But you've got somebody that's working there, removing them, not only from the things that you've done, but remove them from your life so that you won't sin in the future. That is a great promise from the Word of God. I've only got time for one more passage of Scripture. Man, oh man, this one here could almost be the entire chapter. Powerhouse. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm just going to go to the last verse of it. Last couple verses. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What am I thankful for? I'm thankful that no matter what happens, I'll always be loved. Amen. You mean to tell me, Pastor, that if you sin, you did the very worst vile sin in the whole world, God would still love you? The Apostle Paul says, absolutely nothing will ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I know the turtle is recording this. I don't know if he wants to turn his camera on. He doesn't have to. One of the favorite songs that we sing at the nursing homes, we don't sing it every week. It speaks to this very last 
truth. I want y'all to sing this song. We're going to sing it at least a couple times. I pray that you will allow the words of this simple song to speak to your heart. That you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt God loves you with an everlasting love. He always has. And because of your faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, He always will. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you know Jesus? I think of those cards. I wish they did. Yeah. Be thankful this Thanksgiving. You know Jesus. Shall we pray? Father, at this Thanksgiving time, we thank you that you loved us enough that you gave your Son, your only begotten Son, that simply by believing in him, we can be made part of your family and receive the gift of eternal life. We thank you, Father, that your Son understood that we would end up messing up. And that's why we're taught in 1 John chapter 1 that if we'll just confess our sins, he will be faithful. Meaning every single time. We don't have to worry about, well, he may forgive me this time and he may not forgive me. No, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Not just forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We give you thanks for what Jesus has done in forgiving and cleansing us. We thank you too for Romans chapter 8. That nothing, nothing will ever be able to separate us from from your love that we have through Christ Jesus. We thank you, Father, for these and so many other things. And we pray that you might accept from our hearts this morning our deepest thanks for all that you've done. Please guide us in living for you. Help us to honor you at all times. As we have a chance to sing an invitation hymn, if there are decisions that we need to make, Help us, Lord, this time to make that decision that you would have us to make. Make it for Jesus' sake, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Think about this song as you sing it. Turn to page 363 and please stand. 
finish up our study of arrogance and pride, so pray that that's going to go well. And then Tuesday night, no Wednesday night service is going to be on Tuesday night, it's going to be a Thanksgiving service, and we're going to, Lord willing, trace a little bit where Thanksgiving came from here in America, with the pilgrims and so on and so forth, so we'd invite you to be here Tuesday night. All hearts and minds clear? Amen. Amen. Let's be dismissed then this morning with the closing word of prayer. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Charlie, would you leave us the closing prayer, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful, brisk Sunday morning and the opportunity for all of us to be in your house. Father, we pray that you'll bless the folks here and our pastor Tim with your message this morning. We pray for our sick and our needy and our shut-in. We pray for our law enforcement folks and our men and women in our military. And a special prayer this morning to our Heavenly Father, that we will all be reminded on this Thanksgiving week of all the wonderful things he does for each one of us. Father, thank you for all your blessings in the past and all your blessings each day. Now, Father, we pray that you'll leave with us each one. Guide and direct us throughout this week and bring us back safe next time. Father, we love you and give you all the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.